Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Anthea Godfrey. Hi, Anthea. Hi, Sue. It's lovely to speak to you today. We were just chatting there. It's Oh, it's ages ago since I, uh, I asked Anthea if she would like to be a guest and we keep trying to organise something. But anyway, today we've managed it. So yay for us for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I have a bio here from Anthea. As an active and well-known embroidery lecturer and examiner, Anthea Godfrey has a detailed and passionate understanding of the embroidery world from academia to couture. She has a wealth of experience and knowledge of embroidery and textiles and has held a number of posts within the Embroiderers Guild. Currently, Anthea is the artistic director and it is through the Guild that I met Anthea. Her teaching encompasses every facet of the textiles and embroidery world. Her teaching experience is extensive, primary school, secondary and further education, a number of senior posts and has been on many educational and governmental committees supporting textile art and embroidery. Anthea has a long-standing knowledge and connection with the craft world and is keen to forge beneficial relationships between like-minded organisations to promote stitch. Internationally, Anthea has lectured all over the world, has been a City and Guilds Assessor, Chief Examiner for the Association Examining Board and is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. And as Anthea says on the Embroidery Skill website, the future of our textile world needs our support and help to maintain and develop what we know and love. We underestimate our strength and influence at our peril and the future peril of our subject area. We owe it to the past to pass on our heritage in a healthy form with value added. We all know how embroidery has meant to us. We need to shout this from the hilltops. So there we are. So I love that um, comment at the end about shouting about embroidery from the hilltops. And this uh, podcast really is my little contribution to shouting about um, embroidery and textile arts. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. So there we are, Anthea. Crikey. Uh, is there anything in embroidery that you haven't been involved with? <laughs> uh, not really. No, no I've, I've tried everything. And uh, but consequently, I like everything. But I was very interested to hear you You just bringing out the fact that I support um, really creativity. And if I could just start by following on from what you said. Yes. Um, I started a petition for creativity a couple of years ago, uh, supported by, obviously, the Embroiders Guild and um, Upper Street Events, which runs the Knitting and Stitching Show. Yes. And I could see that there was the beginning of the end of creativity in schools. And everybody laughed at me to start with. Said, no, no, it's not possible. It's not possible in this country. Anyway, we've seen it happen. Mm. Now, it's actually on the news. And uh, my petition, although I haven't had as many signatures as I would like, because I'd like 100,000 to take me to Parliament, but I've got about 10,000, and it's growing slowly. But the biggest thing of all, it's, it's raised awareness, even if people don't want to sign up for it. It's raised awareness, and I'm now hearing in the last it, almost five, six weeks, uh, celebrities all over the country, when they're being spoken to in the, by the press, they're saying, where's creativity gone? Even mm. Ed Sheeran said, where on earth are we going to get the next generation of musicians if we don't have music in schools? And this is where the petition is. It's about creativity totally. It's Obviously, I'm an embroiderer, textile artist, but it's also about art, dance, drama, music, all those things that make make us tick. It it certainly does. And is there a certain place where we can all go and um, sign that as well, Anthea? Yes, yes. You can go onto the Embroiders Guild uh, website and you'll find it there, Petition for right. Creativity. Or you can look on Google and just say Petition for Creativity and it comes up. Right, brilliant. And it is absolutely so important. I mean, mm-hmm. ma- many of my guests have all talked about some of them had an excellent experience at school. Others didn't with regards to, you know, textile arts or a kind of art and creativity in general. Yeah. So it, it really is. And yet I, you know, I get emails from people who've listened from all over the world and quite a lot of them will say, oh, um, you know, everybody seems to have so much more 
um, support and education in textile arts and embroidery in the UK mm. than we do yeah. anywhere else. And I'm thinking, yeah. we're all saying, oh, it's really yeah. dwindling. So I, I really hate to think what it's like in other places as well. Well, right. But, but so you see, on nice. the other hand, uh, China and India, who have always been supporting academia, are now realising how important creativity is. Mm. And they're putting it back into their yes. education where we're taking it out. I know. I mean, it's madness. It, it madness. is. And, and do you know what? I mean, my, my background is I started life as a, as a mainframe computer programmer. Mm. You know, why am I still doing this? But that's mm. creative. Anything to do yeah. with technology is immensely yeah. creative. And people laugh, laugh at me going, oh, well, A, a I'm, I'm, I was a computer programmer. And B, I fiddle about with embroidery. And I think mm. it's hilarious. Well, hang on. They're both very, very creative yeah. things. You know, so it's it's so so important. Yep. So yep. normally, my question is about you know what you're working on and what's got you excited. Well, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> this is a passionate thing, isn't it? Oh, the it is, uh, campaign it for it's creativity. Very important. Absolutely, it but is. But the embroidery going alongside that, of course, is is keeps me going as well. And <clears throat> the position at the Embroiderers Guild as artistic director has given me the opportunity of being involved and facilitating a, a lot of. Uh, exciting projects over the last few years yes and um, at the moment we're just about to launch uh, the results of the 100 heart um, exhibition which is going into um, knitting and stitching shows and also exhibitions all around the country yes and um, we wanted to to join up with SAFA to commemorate the ending of the of World War One uh, we thought at the Guild that we, we said 100 hearts, we'd get 100 hearts. Mm. But actually got we got nearly 700. Wow, that's fantastic. Which is just fantastic. It's been a huge uh, struggle to get the whole thing managed and, and online. But to my goodness, the stuff that's coming through is lovely and the exhibitions are going to be gorgeous. Yes, I've, I've seen some of those. Now, well, that was one of the yeah. things that I didn't manage to get done but I did take part in the underfoot competition. Yes, and, good. you know, I always make an effort to contribute to these things, but the hearts, yeah. that fell by the wayside. I had yeah. a pile of client work to yeah. do, and it, it just never got done. But I'm looking forward. I think there's the um, exhibit at uh, Tenants in um, Laban in it. Wensleydale. That's our nearest one. Yes, so, that's right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to make an effort and go and, up to And there. the two knitting and stitching shows. That's which, right. Well, see a lot of people coming through. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah I'm looking forward to those. So there we yeah. are, two, two yeah. lovely, exciting projects exactly. there. Yes. Exactly. But I'm also involved at the moment uh, on the Waltham Abbey embroidery, which is a commemorative set of nine panels um, commemorating the history of Waltham Abbey, which will be delivered to um, the Abbey mid, mid next year right. on a boat on the River Lee. Oh, which is, how it's coming to fruition at the moment, and that's really exciting. And I've just been asked to be involved in a, in a major transatlantic uh, uh, project uh, 26 foot panels to commemorate 400 year 400 anniversary of the commemoration of separatism in Massachusetts 1620. <laughs> wow! So uh, they want us to be involved in it. Uh, the the guild don't know about it yet, which of course they're now going to. But it's uh, it's going to be quite an exciting thing. And lovely to be working in in partnership with a with another country, which is yeah, great. Yeah, how exciting! Well, well, those are six very <laughs> exciting projects that you're working on at the moment yep, Anthea yep. so that's there's, brilliant there's more there's more <laughs> my own work I'm working on men I have known right which is which is quite controversial yes and, and even the family don't know what the hell I'm talking about but <laughs> it's it's um it's celebrating men um I, I think they get a raw deal, deal at the moment and uh I'm not making them out to be stars or anything like that but I just like to redress the balance a little because I wouldn't be where I am today without the men behind me. So that's, that, that'll be coming out at another time, which I won't, I won't go into. Yeah. But that's a really exciting thing that I'm working on myself. And I'm also thinking about, um, uh, I've been developing my own school at home, um, uh, textile printing and embroidery. Oh. And I'm hoping to actually get really stuck into that very shortly. Yes. So that's exciting for me. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you get time to go to sleep? <laughs> Uh, no, I get less and less. Uh, I'm 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 clocking up four and a half hours at the moment. Oh, crikey! <laughs> crikey. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's an interesting point about the men I have known. Certainly, my last one, I think the the piece the piece dedicated to him um, would be full of holes and full of needles. I think, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but other than that, everybody else would be very positive. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. We could talk all day. Yeah. How how did you first get interested in embroidery and textile art, Anthea? Well, I don't think it was a conscious um, influence, but um, my whole family were artists of one sort or another. And uh, my mother became a fashion designer and then an embroiderer. And uh, she was brought up, really, by her great aunts, who were court dressmakers. Ah, right. And um, she, she, at the age of 10, was was, uh, collecting uh, threads and beads for the flapper dresses that the, the, the... the aunts, great aunts used to make. Oh, lovely. And uh, although I didn't realise what that was about at the time, really from a very early age, there was embroidery about, art mm. about, people were talking about it all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't nothing about politics or anything like that. It was all about art. How lovely it was, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's where it all began, really. Yeah. And, and I never really wanted, my father was a scientist, my mother an artist, and I got torn between the two. I'm an only child. And uh, I wanted to be a scientist, and my father, mother was up furious about that, <laughs> but she didn't want to influence me. Yeah. So she thought it would be a very good idea if I went to a foundation course, which of course is fantastic. And of course, this country has now decided it isn't <sighs> because it's not cost effective. But it's the best year in anybody's life because you come out with a qualification, you come out well rounded and understanding of the world of art, and you can either move on or you can take that into the rest of your life. So I did a foundation at uh, Chelsea. And then I went on to Goldsmiths. Now, I went there because I didn't know that all the best embroiderers, uh, embroidery lecturers were there. Mm-hmm. My mother was very sneaky. <laughs> she introduced me to one or two people who, of course, uh, eventually knew my work. And uh, I got a place and I stayed there. And then I did my teaching practice there. Right. That's how it all started. Right. So then you moved into a, obviously then you've been, you know, through the education yes, um, yes. route as, yeah. as your main kind of professional yeah. aspect. So. Well, it was difficult to start with mm. to get into it because, I mean, any embroiderer coming out wanting to teach, it's almost impossible to get a full time job. Mm. And it was the same in the 60s. But I went into a social priority school uh, in North London um, and it was fantastic. I met with 11 other aspiring creative teachers in a school of really retrained men after the war. And it was a struggle between discipline and creativity Mm. and academia. It was really like a melting pot. It was fantastic, (laughs) really, although very, very hard. Hard, But But I came out of it learning so much about uh, young people with difficulties, and I find that they are the most rewarding people. Mm. Um, It was a fantastic time, and I still know an awful lot of them. And a lot of them who had absolutely nothing to give society at that time. You know, they blew up cars in Tufnell Park. <laughs> they, they, one of them owns, part owns the um, Winter Wonderworld in, in Wonderland in, in Hyde Park at Christmas. <laughs> right. I mean, they, they, they've gone on to do yeah. uh, dancing and drama and art, being artists and fashion designers. And I just think that's amazing. Mm. It it, it yeah. really is when people can have the opportunity to to do things and to shine yeah. in a, in a different that's way. Right. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. I, I I still encourage my son. He struggles academically, but he mm. he likes. You know, he's he's lucky at the moment. He is still able to do drama and art, mm. and it shows mm. that as his GCSE. So you know, yeah. it, it makes such a difference. It really yeah. does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So obviously, if you come from that creative family background, then so yeah. Yeah. Kind of who who or what have been major inspirations to you over the years, then, and and also currently, Anthea? Well, I suppose really it it was my mother and uh, my uncle, mm. who who was head of furniture design at um, what was it, the University at Buckinghamshire, right? And uh, it was just all about art and and how to live and you know anything gardening, cookery. I went into music, I went into drama, um, you know, I might have even been uh, the little girl in uh, National Velvet, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know who got it. <laughs> I, I just regret not having the ring, but um, I did all that kind of stuff when I was a, when I was a kid. Yeah, and, uh, and the influences after that were my lecturers, you know, like Constance Howard, Beryl Dean, uh, Christine Risley, 
ma- I mean, you know, major forces. I mm. didn't realize at the time, but mm-hmm. they were major forces. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was just a wonderful time. But also the teachers in other subjects too, um, people who taught me history of art. But of course, all these subjects now are not on the curriculum anymore. So I don't know where youngsters who go into the art world are going to learn their craft. You know, great, great, great drawers, great life drawers. Yeah. None of that anymore. No. It's really sad. But no, I, I have been influenced by, by some great people and some people who had nothing to do with art either. People who had just good, uh, a moral outlook on life, um, you know, caring for people. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a great people person, really. Yes, yes. Well, that, that because... comes across so strongly as the kind of thread through everything, basically. Yeah. Is, yeah. is is It's the people, isn't it? It's yeah, it en- is. encouraging it people, mentoring, support, bringing yeah. people together. Such a strong theme throughout your life there, Anthea. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say, oh yeah, so maybe people think that YouTube um, will do for everybody to learn all of these skills, you know, that seems to be the thing at the moment, let's go and learn it on YouTube, but, but then the YouTubers need to learn some skills as well, don't they? So you know. They do, they do, <laughs> and it's all very well putting how to do a chain stitch on, on mm-hmm. YouTube, but nobody actually tells them what to do with it, <laughs> and and the biggest problem is that we're, it, we're not getting it in education either. Mm. Yeah, uh, and, and the, the colleges are saying, well, you know, we can't afford uh, a te- technical advice anymore, so go to the library. Yeah. Now, are the are the books in the library good enough? Yeah. Well, a lot uh, of those will be out of date by now. I well, should as well. they you will. Know, they're suffering but, as well, aren't they? The library right. services. But, but there's another flip side to that. You know, you say about uh, keeping up to date. There are an awful lot of old books which would tell us so much. And the new librarians are saying, well, they don't look glossy and lovely. <laughs> the students don't want them. Mm. So we throw those out. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's where, where the real skill comes from. It may need a new package, but the skill and the understanding and the history is all there. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on that really we need to say, hang on a minute, yeah. just stop this. Yes, we, yes. We mustn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. No. And I think encouraging the... It's like having the Guild Scholars and, you know, the yeah. thing that I, I really enjoy is that there are, and I have spoken to quite a lot of younger textile mm. artists who are starting or at the early ages yeah. of their careers, yeah. you know, and yeah. it's yeah. lovely to see them, you know, making well, I, a living. I mean, it's not easy, is it? But it's, no. it's lovely to see them coming through despite... Right. But a, 25 a years ago, Andrew Salmon at the uh, Knitting and Stitching mm. show uh, said to me, what can we do uh, for embroidery? You know, and I said, "Well, it's the youngsters we need to be helping." Yeah, and it was at that point that he really—I mean, it was his courage that enabled me to do it. But um, we started first of all the graduates. Yes, and um, about halfway through, about fifteen years in, I wanted to do a retrospective of all those students that we chose out of all the thousands that we had at that yes, time. Yes, yes. And um, it just wasn't possible. But now there's a glimmer. Yes. And I, th- I think the Knitting and Stitching Show may well allow me to, to do it. Yes, well, that would be lovely. So we can it? look back. Some of them will have gone by the wayside. Mm. Uh, it's like um, we have, we're doing a retrospective of those people who left Goldsmith, the first Goldsmith graduates uh, to leave because that happened in the 60s. Yeah. And um, my year with Gonson Tower, the first year to go out with a degree. And we're having a retrospective in November Ooh. at Gold, Goldsmith Gallery. And it's very interesting that um, there are people who've carried on and th- their life is embroidery. Yes. But what they learned on the course, some of them have, have used, some of them have gone into publishing. And uh, then there are others who, who maybe haven't done it at all. But it's affected their lives. Yes. Yes, very and, much and so. And that's, that's the important thing. Yes, it is. And that's something that comes across so many yeah. times when I speak to my guests. So yeah. you, you've, um, you mentioned there about techniques and the importance of keeping techniques alive as well. Yeah. So what would you say your favourite techniques, Anthea, and why do you like them so much? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a bit of a kind of contrast, really, because mm. I, I'm all about uh, freedom uh, within education, Within within design, yes. Although I believe very strongly in research and developing ideas that become your own, uh, but I also want to see that it, the, the the piece of work that you've designed is carried out as beautifully mm-hmm. and as technically perfectly as possible. Um, but that doesn't mean 
making it tight and kind of cold. It's just about quality. We had, I think perhaps in the 60s, we had a, an explosion of people who said, I can't do anything, all I can do is a kit. Mm-hmm. And the teachers came in and said, oh, yes, you can. What we'll do in a four-hour session, we'll blow your mind and you will do something wildly creative. <laughs> well, that was fine. But it, it actually didn't really allow for that technical innovation and, and mm, creativity yes. and quality. And we now really need to come back to that. So my, my techniques are, on the one hand, they have to be commercial. Yes. And they, you know, if I'm doing beading, the beading has to stay on the garment. Mm-hmm. It can't all hang off. And, yes. and, you know. But also, when, when I'm doing Ornue, the lines have to be absolutely accurate. Otherwise, what's the point? Yes. So, but I will, I will do extra. I will do other things with it. I will break the rules. And, and that's, that's what makes me tick. So gold work in, in a very modern, uh, creative way and Ornue in a very creative way. Um, and I love applique in all its forms, decoupe, inlay, uh, stump work as well. I mean, I'm crazy about stump work and three-dimensional uh, ideas. Yes. Uh, and surface stitchery, but in a, in a different form. I, mm. I don't want to just use chain stitch or cross stitch. I want to enlarge it. To Well, I did a, a something for this in stitching show once, which was a 20-foot square <laughs> care bear in yeah. cross stitch. Yeah. <laughs> and the cross stitches were... Two foot square, <laughs> wow. which was which was something. But I love challenges. You know, yes. I like to uh, to break the rules. So those are the things that I love. Yes. Uh, machine embroidery comes with it because uh, machine embroidery allows you to enrich fabric yes, very uh, much so. quicker and yes. cheaper. Yes, very much. Uh, but so. I also love print, which also does the same thing. So I've been a great exponent of print with machine embroidery, with hand embroidery and beading <laughs> so that you, you don't cover the whole surface in beading. You use beading in a way like the Pantelis painters did in spots and colours and textures. Yes, yes. So I it's like not just, those. you know, just not, not like a fabric that you can buy from John Lewis. It's not there's anything wrong with yeah. <laughs> John Lewis's fabric, but, you know. It's you, nice you to really make our that. own creations, yes, isn't exactly. it? Yes, yes. So yes. those are lovely. Now, um, yes. I know you came up to Bishop Burton College and did the Yorkshire yes. and Humber summer yep. school and you did it on yep. your way there didn't you yep. so yep. yes i wasn't able to get there so I, my, my son's 14 so i've still got to him to, <laughs> him oh. to consider so yeah. i'm hoping i might be able to uh get get there this summer but anyway so yes so on your way now i haven't seen many examples of that around either so that'd be quite interesting to well uh, it's it's very slow mm. and most people uh although they say they haven't got time to do anything anymore, which I really question. Um, I do think if you're committed to it, you'll find time uh, to do something which, at the end of the day, is quite exquisite. If you if you look at the the Ornier pieces of the Middle Ages, they they were they were done over in in difficult circumstances at, yes. in candlelight. Yes, but still they did it, and they they wanted it. They were doing it for the glory of God. Mm. Uh, mm. which we don't do now. Yeah. But what we do is for the glory of the art form. Yes. So what's wrong in spending I spent 450 hours on a on a, an A4 piece of air or new for the Magna Carta and embroidery piece. Wow. And I loved it. It's it was just a challenge and it it was lovely to to see it finished and actually in the 13 meter Magna Carta. Yeah. <coughs> Wow, 450 hours, that's that's an amazing amount of yeah, time. But as you yeah. say, it was something that you were so happy, yeah. so happy to do. And, and it done... looked outstanding when it was done as well. Absolutely, so. but we've also just done the, the Game of Thrones yes. White Walker. Yes. That that was six metres by four yes. metres. And that took, well, I worked it out last night, funnily enough, it took 25,000 hours. Wow. That's that was... counting up all the people involved. Yes. And so averaging out what they would have done on the piece. Yeah, yeah. It's at 25,000 hours. Yes, because I was, I was going to move on to that because we normally yeah. don't talk about the kind of high points and obviously you've got loads, but the the kind of recent high-profile projects have been very much, there was the Magna Carta and then yeah. hot, hot on its heels, there was the Game of Thrones that's it, piece that's as it. well. And that is an outstanding piece. I was lucky enough to see that. I think it was at the Stitching Show, but it also yes, was, it, was, yeah. it was in Yorkshire as well when we had our regional... Um, 
at the yeah. Bank Bankfield Museum. Yes, they loved yes. it up there. Yeah. That was fantastic. I really loved seeing yeah. that as well. So, yeah. So in terms of those high points, um, I guess those are high points. Um, do you want to just kind of talk through a bit? Yes, about I mean they, those? they certainly were because I mean I've 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 done a lot of uh, scenic stuff for the theatre and things like that, but I've never actually done or been involved in anything so massive. And they yes. were both Both huge. massive, yes. And also working, the, the first one, Magna Carta, working with Cornelia Parker on it. Um, you know, she's she's a, a, a master at uh, installation art and mm. using craftspeople. And she hadn't used embroidery before, so it was a new thing for her. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was amazing that bringing together uh, four different aspects of the embroidery world and, I mean, let's face it, most people tend to kind of retrench and go, go in themselves. And particularly if you're a company, you, you're, you protect yourself. Mm. The Rogers Guild protects itself. Mm. And, you know, what, what we did was we went out and we, we went into um, academia, which was uh, uh, the Royal School of Needlework. And they loved the idea because it meant that their, their workroom staff and their students could be involved in this big piece. Yes. And it's, of course, a piece, it's a, uh, it's a work experience for them. Yes. Uh, the, the fine cell people, uh, the fine cell work, yeah. uh, the long-term prisoners, I mean, that was amazing for them to be involved in something in the outside world and be considered for something so amazing. Yes. Um, and they are tutored by... Uh, volunteers, many of them in Rogers Guild members, yeah. who go in and teach their craft, and they come out with something. And if you talk to them about what embroidery has done for them in their lives, it's mega. Yes, I mean these men are in their cells for twenty-three hours a day for thirty years. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And they come out, and they've they've earned money from from learning a skill, and they come out, and they're completely different people. Yeah, that's what the prisons should be doing. Yeah, the, right. um, when I was speaking to Lindy Richardson from an yes, Edinburgh yes, School of Art, yes, yes, yes. She, um, she's doing a lot of work with, she with prisons as well. And, yes. you know, that was a, a very, very interesting episode from her, yes. if anybody wants to kind of end, explore that idea a bit more yes. as well. So, yes. yeah, that was absolutely super. Yeah. So, um, and yeah. And then, of course, we went, we went to the commercial world as well. Yes. Um, bringing Hand and Lock in, who are very keen on being involved in, in the outside world as far as they're concerned. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they run their conferences and they, uh, they have the international uh, uh, fashion competition with embroidery. Um, you know, huge projects. And we need to be part of that world, all yes. of us. All of us, yes, you know, that's And right. celebrate it together, not be uh, apart from them. Mm. That's why I brought the four together. Yes. I couldn't have done it on my own. Yeah. I couldn't have done it with the members of the Guild either. Mm. Yeah. Because... I needed experts in certain things. And it, it's also encouraged people to come forward. We had, I think it was 70 came forward for that. Yes. For the Magna yes. Carta. Yes. We had 140 for it, for uh, the Game of Thrones. That's right, yes. Yeah, so. The members' challenge has gone from 30 to 81 right. this year. Yeah. It, it's all about encouraging people and making them feel as if they're part of an exciting new world. Well, I, yeah. I, that's that's one of the things I really enjoy about being a guild member is, you know, I'm, I say I am a dabbler, but for me, mm. it's really nice to be able to take part and submit yeah. work for these exhibitions. I did a page yeah. 17 one and the um, Capability Brown, because yeah. then you, you, it's nice to see your work being exhibited Else, elsewhere, you know, even though you're not a, a professional yeah. or, you, yeah. you know, it's it's just lovely to yeah. do that and then go and see everybody else's work and to that's share, right. you know, that's, to well, me, we, such it a key part. It's about sharing mm. and it's about being proud yes. of what your members can do. Very much so, very they, much They so. do it within their own communities, their own, you know, in their branch areas. But to celebrate a branch's work nationally and possibly now across across the Atlantic you know, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. What a lovely feel-good factor. <laughs> it really is. And we need as many feel-good factors as we can yeah, get with these tears do. on for you. That's, that's certainly, certainly very do. true. So now, uh, did I notice the Game of Thrones piece? That's at some college. Is it in Scotland yes, it, at the moment? Yes. I mean, the uh, Caledonian, Glasgow Caledonian University have been wonderful to us. And uh, along with our chairman, Muriel um, Campbell, 
um, she's negotiated for them to look after it. Right. So they've got it in a secure store up there. But when they saw it, uh, they fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they brought it out uh, this autumn, and I went up and and spoke to it in the... um, in the main hall yeah. where they where they receive all their freshers. And uh, the, this main event was for uh, the staff to meet again after the, the summer holiday. Yes. And for the piece to be seen by the freshers coming through. Mm. And it's, it, it was fantastic. We got amazing coverage on Scottish television and in the media and social media. And they just absolutely adore it, uh, which is really nice. And uh, now, of course, it's waiting to be auctioned. Is it? So it's going right. to stay there until oh. it's auctioned. Yeah. Right. I was wondering what was going to happen with it, because yeah. that's the other thing, isn't it? People are kind of working away on these massive projects, and then you think, of right, course. now what? What's, what's going exactly. to happen with exactly. it when, when the thing exactly. it was done for is, is over? So That's right. Oh, that's well, we had hoped, of course, that um, uh, HBO would, would want it for their main office, but... Yeah. Um, no, it's it, it's it's not happened, I'm afraid. But these things happen; these disappointments occur. Uh, but we're working on it now, so that perhaps uh, maybe even somewhere in America has it. Mm. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing, wonderful talking point for somebody to have if they've got one of these amazing buildings, perhaps in the city. They've got these great atriums that yes, you walk into. Yes, I mean, yes. that's you want, you want him in a big place. Yes, so totally. he's looking down on you. Right. Well, now I'm going to be naughty now, and I'm going to ask you because we normally have a bit of a laugh with all of this, you know. So it's, yes. this is not intended to put anybody on the spot. It's just for a bit yes. of a laugh for anybody. So I'm going to be naughty. And um, have you got any a story of when something didn't go quite as planned and was almost even a disaster? And what did you learn from that experience, Anthea? Well, I think probably. Working in a social priority school uh, was the start of all of that because every day was a disaster. <laughs> um, and you, you did your best yes. to, to get over the disaster. And I learned to avoid disaster yeah. in that situation. And having then gone on to working in, I worked in a, a very special school for uh, the sons of nobility who would killed their parents. Oh. Sounds a, lot, a long title. Wow. But I worked with Dr. Lywood, who was a great inspiration to me. And um, that helped me because that could have potentially been a disaster every day. I was the only woman on site. Yeah. And uh, it was it was scary. Yes, you know? yes. But um, no, t- nothing scares me anymore. Right. And I know that I've got within me enough to get me out of trouble. Mm. So it's, it's back to those people skills again, isn't it? Yes, <clears throat> yes. Very much yes. so. So that's yeah, I don't I don't ever want to to go to bed at night having had a disaster because no. I can't sleep. <laughs> so I I've always thought that you know I mean as a teenager everything was just in a, a kind of milestone of wonderment and I I I couldn't really see one day for the next but it was somewhere around about the age of seventeen when I realised that actually I had to. Uh, prioritise what I had to do during the day mm. and I had to achieve it and there was to be nothing left for the next day <laughs> Wow! and I think there are two types of people in this world and I'm one of those yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why I can do as much as I can do because yeah. everything has to be done it has to be fast, it has to be well organised, I fall down sometimes but there, I can pick myself out of them you know, yeah. quite quickly yeah, so some very, <clears throat> very, very valuable life yeah. skills there, regardless yeah, yeah, of whether they're applied yeah. to embroidery and creativity or not. That's so, right. Yes. I mean, I suppose I had a, a, a slight one in that uh, the film industry works very fast. Yes. Also, cannot imagine that embroidery uh, is done anything other than fast. <laughs> so I got a call from a, a company who were doing um, a film called Orlando. Do you, do you remember it? I, I do, yes. Yes. Well, I, I was asked to do the Queen Elizabeth costume for Quinton Crisp. Mm. And I said, oh, that's, that's fine. Uh, when, when do you want it for? And he said, Thursday. <laughs> and this was the previous Thursday. <laughs> and I thought, you, you must be joking. I said, have I not got more time than this? He said, oh, well, somebody's let us down. And, and Quinton Crisp flies in from America on Wednesday, goes to Hatfield House <sighs> on on Friday, and we needed to go to wardrobe Thursday night, and bike, biked up to him in Hatfield House, and he then 
flies to Spain uh, uh, the following morning. Uh, uh, dearie, dearie, oh, dearie, me. Dreadful. Yeah. So anyway, I took it on because I could see uh, that there was nobody else and time was going. Yes. And they needed this costume. Yes. So I got, I, I got the uh, fabric on the Friday and I got the beads for it because they wanted it all beaded. Not uh, like, well, of course, it had to yes. look good. It had to look good. <laughs> I got all the beads on Monday morning. Oh, crikey. And I've, all weekend I framed up um, a huge a garment, yes. frames. And I got all the back pieces on and everything was ready. Then I got the fabric onto the top. And then Monday morning I took half of them in to college and it was the end of term, thank yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I had half at home. Yeah. So I went in and I got a group of students who were willing to work Brilliant. with me. Brilliant. They got onto it in the day. I went home and I, I beaded for four nights oh. in bed. Oh. And I got it done. Oh, I've been saying, well, poor, <laughs> yeah, wow. it, was, it was a nightmare, a, a nightmare. But working in the theatre makes you work fast. Yes, you yes. have a deadline, and you know that you're, you're finished in the theatre if you don't finish on the deadline. Uh, so absolutely. that gives you a, a lot to work for. I tell you. Well, exactly. So, so really, then the, the, the next question is not me about those dreaded UFOs lurking in the backs of cupboards. Do, do you yeah. have any? Do you have any I've UFOs? Got one of those. <laughs> I have. I have. I was thinking about it, and I thought, no, no, I haven't. I said, yes, I have. <laughs> Some time ago, my husband went to live and work in Kenya. Right. And I went out to see him, and I fell in love with, with this amazing array of of bodies of zebras, all right. reflected in a river. Yeah. And I also found out that if you look at a zebra from sort of uh, 50 metres away, it becomes a grey horse. Mm. Yes. So I, I started to work on camouflage and mirages and all sorts of things like that. And I thought, no, I'm going to make a big thing of this. Because I, when, I, when I was at college, all my pieces were about eight foot high. <laughs> so I thought, right, I'm going to do a big thing here. So I, I made this, I designed this panel of black and white pattern and rippling and water and all sorts in eight panels, uh, six foot high and two foot wide. <laughs> And I got all the all the printing done. Everything was printed, and then I was to ornier a some of it, yeah, <laughs> and bead fringe the other. <laughs> now this is me thinking, I know how to do this. It's no problem. All I have to do is enlarge it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't work that way because <laughs> when you're working on a two foot wide, six foot long panel, your body doesn't allow you no. to to reach over it. No. And ornier a has to be done vertically. Right. So how was I going to do the top down to the bottom? Well, I tried. Yeah. And the the, the wiggle the wiggles the lines went wiggling everywhere. So I ended up with sixteen panels, <laughs> so that I could work sort of slightly sideways for yeah. the or new a. And but I've I I mean the the threads break. There's nothing in the world that is the right strength of thread to hold probably half a pound of beads. Mm, yes. Yes. I mean, people will say, well, why don't you use, um, you know, the, the fishing line? Yeah. Well, the fishing line that would take the weight would poke and wouldn't flop like a proper fringe, you see. Yes, that's so, right, yeah. So yeah, I've, yeah. Uh, that is in a box in the roof. <laughs> I will do it. I will do it. It sounds like an epic piece. It is. <laughs> it's it an is. epic piece. <laughs> I think that's the most epic, epically large UFO <laughs> we've had so far, Anthony. <laughs> I like it large, you know. Yeah, well, I can tell that. That's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I think in terms of just a, a quick wrap up there, you did mention about your future plans and projects that are kind of coming coming along next mm. at, at the start there. Mm. So say so you've got the, the launch of the Wolf and Rabbi panels yes, next yes, year and then these yeah. this project with america sounds yes. very interesting as well isn't it so yeah. and and your uh, and your, your menu of known school. as well yes, yes. and your school <laughs> so, <laughs> so those and are your men, plans yeah, and right. projects yes um so i know coming up is the knitting and stitching shows they're coming up very you. shortly so are, are yeah. you going to be there for anybody to come I'll, say I'll hello i'll be there every day brilliant um, ali pally from thursday to sunday and uh, Harrogate Thursday to Sunday. Right. Well, I shall definitely yeah. come and say hello on uh, yeah. pro probably the Sunday in Harrogate, I should imagine. I'll Excellent. be there. Well, we're in the King's Suite in Harrogate, and so come and see me. Yes, certainly. Will and do. I'm in the West Corridor just as you enter um, with the graduates, the Members Challenge on the right hand side, right the way along the corridor. 
Right, well, so there we are, everybody. Go and say hello yeah. to Anthea. She's um, <laughs> shared some wonderful stories with us today and um, a lot of insight into creativity and how crucial it is to our ongoing well-being and... Um, yeah, it it's it, it needs supporting. So go and sign does, the go and, go and sign the petition if you haven't done exactly. that already, and um, go and say hello to Anthea. If you've got anything specific in terms of a contact, then um, I'll put her email on the show notes of the episode, so Great. you'll be able to contact her through there. It's easier to write it down than say it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. So, Anthea, that's been absolutely fantastic. I'm so pleased that we finally hooked up and got, <laughs> got right. these two. Well, thank you for inviting me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I will see you in November. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> thank Bye. you, Anthea. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 If you like this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitch Me Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery Story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling, and keep creating your very own stitchery stories. <laughs>